Hello, and welcome to Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So, today on Simple Man Sermons, I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to call it a shotgun sermon. Now, those of you that listen to the other podcasts will probably know that that fits right in, but what I mean by that shotgun sermon is just kind of some scattered verses throughout the Bible that stuck out to me this week. Ones that I thought were noteworthy. Not necessarily along a specific theme. But they were a blessing to me, and blessings are meant to be shared. So who knows how many of you out there one or more of these passages may really strike a chord with. So, without much further ado... I'll go through some of these passages and then maybe do some commentary on them. And as often happens, sometimes one verse will have me thinking about another, and I'll mention that one as well. From Deuteronomy 16, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Could you imagine what a better culture and society we would live in today if men simply read the Bible and did what it said. If there were just judges, magistrates, people in power that didn't judge partially, that weren't partial to their their particular thing, blue versus red or donkey versus elephant or whatever other ridiculous things. If they judged each individual righteously according to each one's work. If they judge the people with just judgment, could you imagine what a better culture and society that we would be in? You know, devoid of their socioeconomic status, devoid of how much money they had, devoid of what power and connections they had. If each one was judged according to the the situation at hand. And I don't think that I have to point out that that is not the world that we live in. Many times we see the rich and powerful not held to the same standard as other people. That ought not be so. We ought to judge justly. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. It reminds me of a verse I was just reading this morning, and, uh, you know, morning reading, not one of the ones I had set aside for this, But the penalty for false witnesses, there is, in God's law, penalty for false witnesses. It's the same as would have been done to the person they were accusing. So if you accuse somebody falsely, it's not that the person gets found not guilty, which they should if they're in fact not guilty, but if they're a false witness, the penalty that would have been done to that person is done to the false witness up to and including murder. If they accuse somebody of murder falsely and that person would have died and they did it falsely, then they, they die. If you're taking somebody to court and trying to sue them for $100,000 and you know in fact that it's a wrong thing that you're accusing them of, then you in fact get fined fined $100,000. You get the point there. Could you imagine the transformation in our society if we all just read the Bible and did what it said, you you see the litigiousness of our society today. How litigious it's become. Everybody suing everybody for everything. I have to imagine if we just read the Bible and did what it said, that would not be so. Another one that is written in the law of God, that imagine how much it would transform our society if we just did what it said. When it says, you shall not charge interest to your brother. Interest on money or anything let out at interest. Imagine 
No interest on car loans, no interest on houses, no bankers making interest off of other people. No giant loans, no student loans, no no loaning anybody anything at interest. No interest. Could you imagine the transformative nature that would be on our culture and society? And some people would like us to move away from the Judeo-Christian foundings that we have. But I say we need to double down and be even more Judeo-Christian than we were at the founding. That would be a better society. That's a society that I would rather live in. One that read the Bible and did what it said. Also, if every seven years you were granted a release of debt. Yeah, that's in the Bible. Every seven years, a release of debt. So you're not a debt slave, as many are today. Or every 49 years, there is the Jubilee. Right? Could you imagine that transformative nature on our culture and society? If every seven years, everybody was released from their debt, it would certainly change many industries and in how people often try and take advantage of each other for personal gain. And again, that's a culture and society I'd rather live in. A biblical Judeo-Christian society. The next one. Switching gears, remember I said it's a shotgun sermon. I am a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Again, I start from the first part of that passage. I am a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off. Other verses that makes me think of, it is written, Jesus says, Every hair of your head is known by God. God's, God knows every hair on your head, right? He knows everything about you. Nothing is hidden from God. It is also written, He knows all thoughts and intents of the heart. I think oftentimes when we screw up, when we sin in life, our human inclination is to draw back from God, right? We see this all the way back in the garden. When Adam and Eve, when they eat the fruit, the one thing they were told not to do, what do they do, right? They hide themselves from God. They hide, if you go back and read that story. God wants to walk with them in the midst of the garden and they hide from him because they're ashamed of their nakedness. They hide, they draw back from God. And I think that's a natural human inclination. And I'm going to demonstrate why that's foolish but it's our natural inclination when we sin when we screw up to draw back from God when we just we feel ashamed we feel condemned and we pull back from God but here we see he's not a God afar off and nothing is hidden from his sight I'm not saying you shouldn't repent I'm not saying you shouldn't change your ways and change your behavior and change your thoughts you absolutely should but you cannot hide from God there is no cave deep enough. There is no ocean deep enough. There is no place hidden enough. You cannot escape from God. It makes no sense to draw back from God. In fact, the very opposite is true. When you screw up, we ought to go to God. Not with excuses, but owning it and repentive, saying, I, I need your strength. I need to change. I want to change. And only you can help me. Only God can transform a man completely to be born again and even after we're born again right when we screw up which we all do don't pull back from god go to god in the midst of your sin in the midst of your depravity there's only one that delivers us from sin and depravity and that's christ it makes no sense to draw back he's a god near at hand our helper our salvation our cornerstone don't pull back go to Go to with the right mind, with a right heart. Not like the Pharisee, but like the man that beat his breast and said, Have mercy on me, a sinner. But he still went to pray to God. Right? When you screw up, as we all do, don't pull back from God. He's a God near at hand. You need him. Go to him. Next one, we're going to go to the book of Romans. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, 
who was given to us. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Right, nobody likes trial, nobody really likes persecution or things like that. But no, know that God works all things together for our good, the Bible says. You should praise God and give glory to God when everything's going good, when you get a great blessing in life, of course. But you should also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. What great man of the Bible did not go through hard times? Continuing on in the same, right after this, one of my favorite, favorite verses of the entire Bible. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. There is months worth, worth of theology we could unpack in that one simple sentence. There is so much there. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. It's not because of you. It's not because of how good you are or how strong you are. God didn't die for you because you were good. right? God didn't save you because you were good. He saved you because He is good. He doesn't love you because you're so lovely. He loves you because he is so loving. And that's often what we do or what Satan does with us and they get us focused on self. You're not worthy. You're not this. You're not that. Yeah, you're right. You screwed up. You don't deserve. And and that's all correct. Satan, Jesus says, is the father of lies. And some of the most effective lies are half lies or lies that involve a little bit of truth that is true we are not worthy in and of ourselves right that's that's neither here nor there though while we were still without strength in due time christ died for the ungodly it doesn't say when we tried really really hard and we were 99 percent of the way there he gave us the extra one percent it says when we were still without strength Right? You were dead in sin. I was dead in sin. We were dead in our sin. What can a dead man do? Nothing. No strength at all. While we were yet without strength. Without strength. With no strength. It doesn't say that we did. It says he did. It doesn't say while we were struggling, we really worked hard and got past it. It says while we were Still, without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The ungodly. When Satan comes and says, you're ungodly, you're ungodly, you're this, you're that, you're not worthy. You can come back at him with the word of God, just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. He used scripture. Yes, I am, in fact, not worthy in and of myself. I am, in fact, ungodly. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Which, if I'm ungodly, includes me. Checkmate. Continuing on, because it kind of illustrates this even further. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us while we were still sinners Christ died for us now as Paul says more than once should we continue in sin that grace may abound certainly not what sense does that make he died to save you from your sins so you go back and wallow in your sin like a swine in filth no but realize as it says also in Romans Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes now some people falsely translate that to Christ is the end of the law. That's not what it says, right? It says he's the end of the law for righteousness. He doesn't do away with the law. He says one jot or one tittle will not pass away from the law. But our righteousness, our righteousness, 
is found in Christ. Christ is our righteousness. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our righteousness is in Christ. It is in Christ. It is not our works. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, get the focus off of you and how bad you are and focus on how good God is when it comes to your salvation, when it comes to your position before God. And use that not to sin, but to break free of sin. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the truth is, Christ died to save sinners, of whom you and I are both sinners. The truth is, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. The truth is, it's not about how strong we are, it's about how strong Christ is. It's not about how good we are, but about how good God is. The focus should be on God, right? We love him because he first loved us. He is the author of love. There is no love without God. Focus on the creator of the universe, on the one the one who makes and sustains the universe. That's where our should focus should be, and not on not on ourselves. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Alright, moving on. But, actually this is going to tie in rather nicely, and this was not planned. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Again I read, and you are complete in him. Not only is our salvation, which is a great thing, found in Christ, we are complete in him. If you feel empty and hollow in life, if you feel like the things of this world are not fulfilling you, well good, you're awake. Unlike many people who drudge their way through life thinking the next trinket or the next fulfilling of earthly lust or relationship with whomever or amount of money is going to complete them we know better right been there done that none of that fulfills it's all vanity as it says in ecclesiastes vanity vanity all is vanity and grasping for the wind that's not where our completeness lies you will never be complete with it you will never be whole you will never be satisfied with the things of this world you might be in the world, but you're not of the world. And you're never going to be completely satisfied with things in this world. Ooh, this thing, this is preaching to myself. Especially this week when I got distracted by so many Babylonian baubles and trinkets. And you know what? It leaves you frustrated and a little bit empty when you focus on that stuff. Because the fulfillment is not in that stuff. If you get a good gift, realize the good giver is God. And don't worship the thing, worship the giver. Be thankful for the blessings you've been given. Use them to serve God, but don't worship them. Our completeness will never be found in any amount of money, in any amount of land, in any trinket, in any whatever your thing is. Fancy car, firearms, sexual attraction, relationships, notoriety, power, respect. None of that. That's not where our completeness comes from. And you'll never be satisfied with this. Look at some of the wealthiest, most powerful people in the world. Do they seem very satisfied? In fact, a lot of them, movie stars, rock stars, whatever, people in power, they crave more power. They crave more likes. They, they're never satisfied. What does the Bible say about Ecclesiastes 5? He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver. Nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. Look at people in power who crave more power. People in popularity who crave more popularity. Or what was written about Alexander the Great, who obviously was not a Christian. When he had conquered 
pretty much every kingdom, every people that he knew that he could when he got to the far ends of the ocean, it said that he wept because there were no more kingdoms to conquer. Right? Because the things of this life are never going to satisfy. You are not complete in that. And the whole world is walking around empty. Lonely. Trying to fill a hole that they'll never fill with the things of this world. Trying to fill a void in their life that cannot be filled by anything in this life. Because only God can fulfill that. Only God can make us complete. Praise be to God that he has revealed that to us. People in this world claiming to have all the answers in earthly things. What does the Bible say? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And he has revealed these things to us as babes. We are complete in him. He is our completeness. You'll be more complete pursuing God and making him number one in your life than anything else. You may think that this amount of money is going to satisfy, but you'll just want more. You may think that this next relationship is the one, this person's the one, but if it's not the one that God has appointed for you, it'll just leave you a lot of times more empty and more lonely and more broken than you were before. We are complete in Him. We are complete in Him. Now, there's a lot more verses I had picked up, but I think that that's a good place to to wrap this up. If you like this style, this is very different than than pretty much most sermons I've ever heard. But if you like this, let me know. I'll maybe do some more of these in the future. It's I do this to serve you guys. So again, if you like this style, reach out to me and let me know. Uh, GoodShepherdTraining.com. If you're not a patron, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. GoodShepherdTraining.com. Or leave it in a review or a comment. That way, you know, it's pretty easy. Anyway, with that, I want to thank you for listening. I am humbled and blessed that anybody listens to this. I appreciate you. Have a blessed day.